Hi everyone, welcome to episode 8 of The Corner. On today's episode, we're going to be talking to our lead business development manager, Jordan Vernon, who you may recognize from previous episodes. We're going to be discussing with Jordan the software sales process and what you as a buyer can do to enhance your buying experience. Jordan Vernon, welcome back to The Corner. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Always a pleasure. I know you're busy, mate. So we're going to try and keep this quick and brief today. But we've got some decent questions here to ask you to help our listeners and watchers uh, on their buying experience. Sounds good. We'll get straight into it. So how can people inquire about software and what should they expect when they make such an inquiry? I think there's, right, with the modern world now, there's so many ways in which you can source information. So obviously the obvious ones use the internet. So review sites, supplier websites. But before you go and do your research, don't don't go to LinkedIn and write a status saying, can everyone recommend me some software? Because all you're going to get is people, probably like me as well, because I've done it. Talk to me about it. Hey, we're, we're really great with this kind of thing. But there's a lot of, there's a lot of free information out there. Um, you know, you can go and narrow down your search by using, I suppose, your common, your G2s. Um, Google reviews are massive. LinkedIn reviews or recommendations. If you go to product pages, you can find a lot of information there. Mm -hmm. Kind of build... It's a bit like recruitment, to be fair, in terms of building a long list. And then once you've defined requirements, kind of get maybe a short list of four or five that you want to actually go and engage with. Okay. I mean, historically, we have had people contact us sometimes that are looking at 10, 15 systems. Yeah. Would you, poor people, <laughs> no one wants to look at 15 bits of software, <laughs> do they? I mean, they even love software too much, or they're getting it wrong, right? Yeah. It's just going to get really convoluted. You won't remember who does what if you go and do I think as well you don't want to try and it's not a race so don't try and put yourself I think we'll come on to it later but don't put yourself in, in the position where you're under an extreme amount of pressure to make a choice get something implemented within a couple of months because mm. it's just won't end in tears really it's not the best way of doing it and okay. around that yeah just you know don't try and bite off more than you can chew yeah and so I suppose have enough time and try and make it targeted obviously we, we're supplying the recruitment industry mm -hmm. i suppose we could liken that to if you're searching for a candidate your boolean string probably needs to be more than one word or two words because you're going to return a lot of results absolutely um, so would we maybe recommend or would you recommend people look at industry specific sort of recruitment so you know if they're education that they might look at uh systems that specialize in education recruitment or have those sorts of Yes, absolutely. And there's some quite, there's sophisticated tools out there as well at the moment that can actually build, you can kind of feed in your requirements and it will give you spit back out maybe some recommendations in terms of what you should be using. Or do, do it the old school way, go around and speak to the users or the people that are going to be using the software and ask them, what do you want in terms of, you know, what areas of your life at work are painful in terms of you know, it could be processing things. It could be the time it takes to achieve simple tasks and build that requirements list out. And then from within that, when you are having those initial conversations or initial research, try and work out maybe from just a website, are those points relevant? So is that bit of functionality in there that, you know, at a high level? And then when you get on to having a, a conversation, make sure you're asking those questions and focusing on what you need mm -hmm. as opposed to what perhaps the sector or industry that you're operating within kind of says is the best thing to yeah, use. There will be some demand from some sectors for things like compliance and stuff. So once they've sort of narrowed down, say I've got a, I'm a buyer now um, and I want to reach out to these software suppliers, what would you say is the best way to contact these suppliers? Good old fashioned telephone. Like just, <laughs> pick, up just phone. pick up the phone and call in. Hopefully you know, most suppliers are going to have a phone number mm -hmm. and just expect that kind of level of contact. So even if you're, if you, let's say you go and use the book a demo button, which obviously is the obvious one as well. Yeah. So that's on some uh, suppliers website. Generally they might have, so we have, and a lot of our competitors and other suppliers in the industry would have a, a button on their website that says book a demo. And I think that can be a bit misconstrued though, in terms of what that means. What okay. people think that means. So if you put in your details there, please do expect like a, a human being to contact you. 
So it's not going to pop up a demo and start just demonstrating the software yeah, extrapolated, would yeah. it? Well, I suppose it would make a lot of us redundant. Um, but yeah, no. So when you put that through, that is going to go through to probably a generic email address on the supplier side, mm -hmm. and then that will be filtered to the relevant person. Um, and then in terms of that, yeah, you're going to get some form of contact, most likely a phone call in the first instance or an email. Um, but it is going to be a, a human being at the other end picking that up, wanting to engage with you to ultimately maybe understand can can that person help you with the solution that they have to offer, I suppose. Okay. We're, we're quite fortunate. We have a lot of um, inbound leads. I would say probably 70% of those come through our website. Mm -hmm. So they would fill in the detail and that would come to our shared mailbox. And then we would distribute that depending on perhaps the customer you know who that goes to um so you will deal with you no know, certain size clients for example what can somebody expect from that initial first point of contact in terms of um a, a qualification call so you're saying they're going to you know expect someone to contact you mm. i think on a few occasions and probably i would say maybe five to ten percent of our inbound leads when they make that initial contact we will go to contact them in a reasonable time frame i mean generally within the hour quite often some of the guys find that people haven't got the time to talk to them and it's almost like they're not expecting that call despite them just make having made an inquiry with us so what what should people expect in terms of that initial point of contact so let's say as an example we've had a a, a company fill out the website form click book a demo they filled in their details and there are 50 user recruitment in uh healthcare sector as a business development manager what would be your sort of first steps with that information uh, you know what would you do with that information and then what what would that contact look like for the for the for the buyer sure so i mean the first thing i would probably do and i would encourage kind of our team to do as well is to do a little bit of research with that information so obviously look at the company website who's done that have a little look at the person that's actually booked the demo as well so obviously in terms of linkedin yeah absolutely i think most of our most of our listeners and viewers will, will be hot on linkedin yeah and it gives you it's amazing how much you can learn about a person just from the linkedin profile you know the things that i would look at is perhaps how long that person has been in the business rightly or wrongly i'll probably make a little bit of a judgment as to how well i think that perhaps that person's going to know the business that they are obviously working within in terms of if someone's been there maybe a month i think it'd be quite unfair to task them with looking at software because but that does happen as well doesn't it yeah a lot and i kind of will sympathize with that in terms of maybe the first on, on that call in terms of you know scoping out do you have you had the chance to be exposed to all areas of the business mm -hmm. what's the process you've gone through before you've kind of got to the point of putting in that inquiry mm -hmm. and i think sorry to interrupt i think depending on the level of that person you know someone quite senior coming into the business that perhaps has, has been there six weeks may have been brought in as a bit of a a change management expert or to to you know improve processes procedures um and, and ensure the business is firing on all cylinders may have had a lot of experience with that before so we're potentially not just looking at their current role but where they've been before what kind of roles they've had and i think someone like that fine but actually someone who's a resourcer or perhaps even a, a, a new to recruitment you know mm -hmm. they've worked in a supermarket for the last two years totally nothing wrong with that if they've been in the business for a month two months are they the right person to be talking to a new new supplier yeah it's hard i think um the, the kind of a i suppose the kind of information you're going to be asked for or i would ask for would be obviously so what are the key processes that you're you're, you're looking to i suppose solve or what the key problems you're looking to solve with mm -hmm. implementing a new bit of tech what the current system that they are they're using at the moment and and the frustrations perhaps around that mm -hmm. and how the business is split out as well in terms of does everyone is everyone expecting the same or a different business function is going to be wanting to use the software in different ways and being able to make a bit of a judgment if to to say is our is the core product going to be suitable or are some integrations going to need to come into play to be able to fulfill everyone's expectations of mm -hmm. uh, a new implementation to to make everyone's lives a bit easier okay i mean i suppose we would compare it and we have often compared it you know with buyers to a recruitment consultant 
qualifying an applicant, you know, if you get sent a CV, this is the equivalent of us receiving a, a, an inquiry through the website. Now, you know, there's, there'll be some recruiters out there who will just go into a system and they'll have technology that passes that information and distributes it. But if that's triggered to a person as this is, this is potentially a suitable applicant, they're going to want to qualify that. And it's not just for the benefit of that of that salesperson. It's for the benefit yeah. of the person inquiring. Everyone's time is valuable. And I think from a, I suppose from the, the salesperson's point of view, they don't want to waste time with someone who they know they're not going to be able to help based off the information they'll glean on, on that kind of discovery call. And from the, the purchaser's point of view, you don't want to be investing time in something that is not right for you and isn't going to work. Yeah. And, and at a very basic level, it can be, you know, does your... You know, if you're looking at software that only works on a Windows machine or a Mac and you use the other, then it's going to be a bit of a showstopper straight away. So, and the same with the kind of, I suppose, the recruitment example you've used there. If a recruiter wanting to talk to a candidate isn't just wanting to waste their time, it's to want to understand, can they help them? And yeah. Has the vacancy they've got? And, 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 and drill down into the detail, and which leads us actually to question number two. So assuming the qualification process is quite in debt, what information are they likely to need yeah so current system and frustrations within that I suppose user numbers contractual obligations which is such a huge and hot topic at the moment um a lot of people that will be something i will ask always personally on kind of call one hmm. i think the success rate on getting an answer or people knowing that is probably down at 20 percent really and it's not so much that you haven't got any right to be looking at other suppliers without sure. understanding, I suppose, your current situation. But a lot of the time, you might, again, go. it goes back to everyone's time being valuable, really. Mm. If you go and invest a month into a process going really in-depth, pulling in other departments' time, other uh, you know employees' time to look at software, and then you make a decision or you like something or you found it and then discover you, you, know, you can't do anything for two years, mm. it's a bit of a... yeah. You know, this wasted a lot of time on, on both yeah. sides. And it's not like you can use that in two years' time because technology moves fast, your requirements will change, your business will change. So it's not like you can sort of, you know, reutilize that time spent to, oh, we don't have to do that when we actually when yeah. we actually do look. And again, I know we've said it before, but the same as qualifying an applicant. You know, if someone sent you their CV and you're going through the qualification process and actually they're, they're, they're saying to you, oh, actually, I'm really happy where I work. I'm really well paid. I've got all these benefits and I'm on a, a, a nine month notice period. Um, you know, you probably got, as a recruiter, you're probably going to say, are you actually serious about leaving or are you looking to leave? You know, oh, I'll work five minutes around the corner from my house. So I don't have to commute. Oh, but you've applied for this job in London. You know, it's all about that sort of qualification, isn't it? So I suppose from a salesperson's point of view, as much as you're not trying to qualify them out of the process or discourage them looking at software, you need to make sure it's a, you know, it's a useful use of your time yeah. and, and their time, you know, because again, you don't want them to waste their time in the, in a process that's not going anywhere. Yeah. And I'm, as you know, and everyone internally knows, I'm quite, I've got a bit of a reputation for qualifying people out quite quickly in terms of things, but that's not necessarily in terms of not wanting to help people, but it's mm. being able to understand that, you know, based on what you're telling me, I don't think it's going to be right for us to go down a path. Yeah. And within that, it's not, I don't know, I, sales has always had a bit of a stereotype of, you know, salespeople are just there to shaft you, they're going to lie to you. Mm. Obviously, there's different areas and aspects that you can look at that, but it's a very consultative sell, or it should be with software anyway, mm. and rushing in and selling a solution that isn't going to work for the customer is, it, it's kind of pointless because it's going to, it will fall apart and everyone's going to have a headache at the end of the process or when that kind of go live ar arrives. So even those kind of, some of these questions are a bit tough sometimes as well. It might feel a bit awkward. So for example, with us, you know, perhaps like limited company information with being a B2B supplier, right. you need to have a, an understanding as well of maybe some of the stuff that would go on that you, you're not aware of. So maybe, you know, with a, a deposit length, you might have a, your company might be credit checked or run through Experian or something like that. Yeah. Um, and again, that's not, there's nothing malicious behind that, but it is it's business to the end. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So obviously cost does come into play quite early on in terms of the qualification process, in terms of how much, um, you know, what their budgets are, how much the software is, either them asking you or you asking them 
what the budget is. Talk to us a little bit about that and how that can sort of impact that qualification process. And if if the budgets don't align with the the cost of the software, what would be our sort of response to that? Yeah, a cost is a hard one because I mean, I suppose the natural thing to do is under look at what you're paying at the moment for what you're using, and mm -hmm. obviously. I suppose the the whole point of changing and implementing a new bit of software is to improve. Right. So generally, if you get something better in any aspect of life, it probably costs a little bit more than what you're paying. So it's a good way to benchmark in terms of what your 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 spend is at the moment. But obviously, this is where it comes into understanding that there's going to be other stakeholders involved. So a lot of the time, the kind of CFO or the finance function perhaps will only get involved at the very end. And then you're finding yourself internally, perhaps you've then got to go and justify why we're going to spend X percentage more a year on the CRM and okay. on the job board or whatever it may be. And the way in which you can get that value to help present that and do that case is through utilizing the sales process and the, the salesperson, I suppose you're dealing with. So mm. if you're presenting a list of problems or pain points, and then you're being presented with solutions, I think it's really valuable to look at well, how much time does that take at the moment to be done manually, perhaps? Okay. And then is the software going to automate maybe 70, 80% of that process? Mm -hmm. And then do a quick calculation on, right, well, if we pay someone X amount of money and they spend X amount of hours doing this a week, do that against perhaps the increase in cost on there. And then that's a good way of looking at, right, well, is this, are we going to receive a, an ROI on it? Yeah. Also, is it worth the increased spend? Sure. And I think, um, you know, like you were saying there, if it, if, it, if it's going to save hours of manual process and you're going to automate it, then that's fine. I think it's really difficult with tech, actually, because you've got everything. That we actually just, I talked about this on episode seven, the previous episode. You've got everything from free apps up to software that's going to cost you two, three, four, five hundred quid a month for a license. So, you know, it's really hard for a buyer sometimes to work out, you know, what, how much does good tech actually cost and i think you know if they're looking it depending on what type of tech you're looking at i think obviously with itris you know it's a it's a crm so it's not just doing one function generally it's going to do a lot you know you're going to manage your applicants your companies your contacts your jobs your placements your rates your compliance your emails your communication you know so i think people should be aware that that may cost more than a, a, a tech that you know, we may partner with or integrate with that perhaps does a, a single function like, um, you know, kind of outreach or, or marketing or uh, job board aggregating or, or something like that. So it is really difficult. And I think you said, you know, look at how much you're spending on your current tech as a benchmarking exercise. Great. Um, but also, you know, look at those, those four or five you've shortlisted, I suppose, getting quotes, um, you know, cost per license early stage will give you a good sort of view of what is, you know, what is the average sort of tech, tech costing, you know, because they're all going to come in sort of there or thereabouts. There's going to be some slightly more, some slightly less, but it'll give you a sort of good average. Obviously, if you've got some down at £20 per user per month and some up at, you know, 120 per user per month, that still would be a big gap. Yeah. And at the end of the day, you get what you pay for. Again, it's the same sort of idea. So there's, as you say, with the CRM, it's doing a it's doing a lot, and it really is generally most businesses' core part of it. Mm. If you took that, removed that away, and then you asked your employees to work for the day, you'd then realise the value that 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 has. Yeah. Um, and again, it's difficult because it's kind of something that's a bit taken for granted as well. You know, you log into it every morning, you just do a go about your day to day, and you probably don't think about it until something goes wrong. It's a bit like um, you know, with a hat. I think a boiler is a good example in a household. Like, <laughs> okay. you, we got my service these Wednesday, actually. <laughs> have you really? Yeah. yeah. Well, that's why I was losing pressure a couple of weeks ago. So this is what I'm thinking about. But you don't think about that. But you take for granted hot water and your radius is getting. Yeah, sure. Hot. So it's it's the same sort of idea. As, as everything's going okay with it, it's all good. Mm. But if something goes wrong, you then actually realise yeah the value that it brings. Yeah. And then that you know testament to again the customer service the support and all that other stuff we've we've gone into before so that's really good i think you know it's i think what we'll probably say to the users and listeners is it is a good idea to have a budget in place you know before you start this journey and at least some idea of what it might cost your business um but be flexible with that you know typically if you've not this is your first outreach to suppliers and you've typically not looked at the market for a long time um 
you know, just get out there to get an idea of what these things might cost. Yeah, and utilize your contacts and your network. You know, um, recruitment's a small world, as we all know, in terms of that. So they'll always, you'll, you'll probably know three or four people who have gone through a similar software or change yeah. management process within the last year in their business. Ask them about it. Mm. You know, it's a good way to get, I suppose, almost word of mouth recommendation. And I think this is where I use this example a lot as well with first impressions. Everyone that everyone will kind of say you'll make a, a judgment on whatever it may be within maybe five, ten seconds of it, encountering it or meeting a person um, initially. And it's the same with software. If you drop a name of a bit of software, mm. it could be, you know, whatever it may be, gauge that initial reaction off that person and you'll be able to tell a lot perhaps even before they even they even start talking. Yeah. I think there's a lot of, there's obviously a lot of like membership networks and stuff like that within the recruitment industry as well who um, you know, would perhaps recommend you speak to speak to a certain supplier. Um, but you know, don't all just fo don't just focus on that. I would say as well. You know, you want to do your own sort of research as well as what's being sort of put in front of you. In terms of the qualification, cool. Obviously, let's say you we going through this process now. Let's say the calls lasted 20, 30 minutes, and um, you know you. It's suitable, it's suitable for both parties to the budget in place or the, or the requirements. Obviously, there's benefit in that to both parties. But as a business development manager, that information you, that you've gathered in terms of their requirements, their their budgets, size of the company, that kind of stuff, what would you do with that information after that call has taken place? In terms of perhaps now you've booked a demo with them, how do you utilize that information that you've gathered on that initial call? Yeah, well, obviously those notes will go into our own CRM, um, so we can refer back to that and understand kind of the the set requirements that are need. And then a couple of hours before that demonstration is booked, I'll revisit those notes and just kind of refresh my memory if it's been a while or a couple of days since that phone call, mm -hmm. and then go about tailoring a demonstration for the needs of that customer. Mm -hmm. So if they if they've got perhaps four key pain points or or well, or a few key areas that they're struggling with. Personally, when I start a demonstration, I will always ask. I can do just a general run through of the high level features, work through, I suppose, the, the key workflows within the software, mm -hmm. or I will give the option to allow the prospect to kind of, I suppose, drive it themselves. So yeah. you can, I'll be reactive. You tell me what you want to see and I'll show you. Mm -hmm. now, I understand that sometimes is a bit of a tough question because it's a bit like it goes back to you don't know what you don't know to a certain extent. Sure. But it's about making sure that the time that you're going to spend on that 45 minutes hour demonstration is actually useful for the person at the receiving end. It's all well and good talking about all of the great features and benefits that you can really slip into from a sales point of view. But mm. that is completely irrelevant to the person listening, then it's pointless. You want to show them how, I suppose, the solution you're presenting can help them and, it's it's them and solve the problems yeah. that they've come to you with. So again, your your demonstrations will be very different depending on the type of business, the type of recruitment they do. Mm. Um, obviously, perm, contract, temp, retained contingency, whether they need compliance, timesheets, you know, other tech they're using. So we might demonstrate sort of how it integrates with like a partner tech. So that will all, you will sort of prep all that before. So you've got an idea of what, you know, what you're going to show, but then also ask them, you know, do you want to go through this in a certain format or do you just want me to show you covering those those key points yeah absolutely and i think it's a, a really common misconception that all recruitment businesses are the same even mm. from recruitment business owners yeah because they're yes of course at a high level you're doing recruitment but mm. in i suppose the positions that we're in it gives you quite a unique insight of understanding that five education recruiters will actually work in completely different ways, different ways yeah from back office function who's involved in the process internally a lot of, you know, some businesses will have a dedicated resourcing function that will just focus solely on candidates formatting the CVs and then the consultants maybe only get hear about them when they have a, a nice formatted CV completely qualified and are presented to them. Where in a lot of other businesses it might be, you know, that that resourcing function is it doesn't exist and everyone's a three sixty consultant responsible for their own um I suppose cycle from candidate call to, to placement. So the needs of it at a high level are the same but the processes and how people want to operate is very different mm. and you can't sh provide or show any value to that particular business unless you understand how they work and within that i think there's obviously 
there are of course similarities but there are different ways in which software can be utilized based on someone's process so it's really important to understand it good and i think that loops that back then to the whole qualification piece you know if that person that's reaching out to a supplier comes on with that information in terms of we've got a team of resources that does x y and z we've got consultants who do x y and z we've got a back office function that works like this and we need plug into this system we've got a there's the senior leader team that need access to these specific reports these are the sort of metrics that we want to gauge from the system and all this kind of stuff you know the number of this person <laughs> <laughs> that's, <correct. laughs> that's the ideal scenario yeah, yeah absolutely i love it it does it does happen um and i think you know as a um obviously having worked in sales a bit on the front line you know for, for a number of years and obviously you know trained now people like yourself to, to come up through the ranks and and others i think as a as, as a as a sales person or someone that you know that is in a sales function uh, as bdr or whatever you want to call them within the tech world has to be good at tech has to be good at demonstrating tech good around the system good at listening to the requirements within recruitment they need to understand recruitment, of course. But then within that, you know, as experience grows, you know, you've certainly, I've seen, you know, how you've grown over the years. And obviously I knew this sort of from myself and looking at other people that have worked in the tech recruitment tech or HR tech industry for a long time. You then start to become an expert on all of the sectors within recruitment. So I have often found myself having, you know, um, sort of, discussions with a, a an oil and gas recruiter about offshore rigs and all this kind of stuff you i will hear you have um conversation with education recruiters about uh their compliance and and terms and what you know what what what's required there so medical again is another thing you know pediatric nurses and all this kind of stuff you know you need to sort of be able to relate to them and i suppose that would help that experience also helps you tailor that demo because yeah. you've got that you know that information and if you can have that information in the system as well to show them that will just relate to them a little bit more yeah and i think within yeah i 100% agree and with all of it within that i mean i never knew about bandings and frameworks and like how that and the various different portals that are used yeah for, you know it's very different in how the nhs works you don't have a phone call with the yeah the hiring manager it comes through and that's kind of how you work it and you work very hard to get on the framework to be in that position to to go in a you know to see and have visual of or have exposure to those vacancies but as you say if when you're going through a demonstration you're being shown joe blogs at abc limited mm. it's very hard to relate to that in an everyday scenario whereas if you're if, if you're a medical recruiter and you're being shown an nhs trust and a band five registered nurse um with a rates metrics and the shift pattern and how that then and how their nurses pin is uh or general medical council details are yeah. logged and they've got their hep b uh, yeah, the, sort yeah. of covid Clients, yeah. whatever it is then you can actually realize okay well this could work for me yeah it's much easier to to go through it and i think there's a lot of value in appreciating if you do do various demos you should mm -hmm. be able to make a judgment as well it's not just about oh, how shiny someone's made it but if if the time has been taken to make it relevant to you mm. and you can understand it more a lot of the time that will you, you'll you'll just get it better yeah and that's, that's not we don't do that for our benefit that's for the buyers yeah, buyers benefit right you know they're not gonna they're not gonna relate to it like you said mm -hmm. if you're placing dot cotton at tesco's if they're in a, if they're an educational or healthcare recruiter or construction or, or whatever it might be whereas if you're you know uh, placing uh you know uh, like you said a battery nurse or whatever it is in an nhs trust they're like oh yeah i know this stuff oh, says, yeah and there, there's a and i think you'll find if you go through various demonstrations you can make that can help in your decision making process mm. because you will if, if if you don't if someone doesn't relate to something it doesn't matter how good it is it's, it's not going to work so investing a bit of time again back on the qualification time on the phone or engaging even if it's via email if it, you don't necessarily have to have a phone call if you can be really specific i, I like it sounds weird to say but i love receiving an rfi retender because yeah. if you've done that well i can tell you within an hour two hours of reading through it and answering the questions whether or not it is worth us it's going to be su it's going to be suitable yeah and if you don't have the time to have lots of conversations which i get we're all busy and you might not do going down the rfi or tender route is mm. great because you can send that out to 20 30 40 different mm. suppliers 
you probably might only get half of them returning it to you and then within that you've got you know your, your five that you're then going to go invest some time in actually you know getting on the phone and, and going date on delving deeper into it so he's going to say going on a date with then <laughs> well, you know. and like you said earlier there is tech out there that can actually help you do that um you know so that that doesn't have to be a difficult process and talking to all of your sort of departments key stakeholders whatever it might be as we discussed previously can really help you gather that information for for qualification me personally as a buyer of tech for our business and personally i can't stand when i do give people this time to you know either go through qualification or put all this information together all this rich sort of information and then i get on a demo with them and then it's just i'm being talked at i just sort of you can tell it's almost a bit scripted it's very you know could have just sent me a video from your previous demo because it's exactly the same so i think we always you know always encourage you know yourself and any of our guys to to really tailor that as much as possible even down to like using the company's branding on something like our power board you know that's so powerful mm -hmm. um so as much information you know from a from if you're a buyer giving us that information can really can really make your demonstration experience of the software for you initially or for your whole team just to, just nicer you know it's a customized it's bespoke this is specifically for you i'm not just gonna sort of either send you this video or i'm not just going to talk at you for an hour you know i understand your business needs and requirements i understand how your business works and, and that's what we're going to do and utilize that because that is free consulting mm. how much would you if i said to you i'll come into your business for a day i'll map out your processes we'll work, understand where the, the issues lie how we can potentially solve them mm. and look at four or five different solutions that could could go and work for you you'd expect to pay that person four or five 600 quid for the day mm. if you engage correctly with suppliers mm. and are prepared you you're you're getting very expensive advice mm. for free which is absolutely fine but you're going to get out what you what you put into it yeah I, th I think you know there is a difference some suppliers you won't get that true yeah with us you will because we're bloody experts but you know that whole change management is, is a change management piece as well as a as well as a sales piece. You know, we want to understand your business, we want to understand, understand the pain points, and almost work with you to to resolve those. And like you said, through the sales consultancy, you're not paying for that. You mm. know, so like I said, utilize it. Good advice. Okay, Jordan. So we have inquiries come in from various different types of people within business, from company owners and directors through to recruitment consultants and even marketing executives. Who should be involved in the demonstration processes and and why? Yeah, so I mean, I think the initial inquiry that comes in, it doesn't really matter who does that as long as they know all of the key information that we were just been talking about. I think more more regularly now, we're actually seeing marketing teams being the the main, I suppose, the initial point of contact mm -hmm. um, from a, a data quality point of view, you know, making sure they have good data continuity in the system is, is massively important. Mm -hmm. And also they usually have a good eye for, I suppose, the creativeness and the aesthetics that's going to be visually pleasing for people to be looking at all, all day, every day. Um, so that is great. I think, especially with larger businesses, I think too many cooks can kind of spoil the broth. So the first demonstration, I think, yeah, just a couple of people on there that kind of understand what, what they're looking for. Most suppliers these days, the initial one will be online, which is typically recorded a lot of the time as well. So, so could they ask for that recording as well and then perhaps show that? Yeah, of course, all the time. I, do, yeah. I will always generally offer that as well in that kind of scenario. Yeah. So then that makes your your first internal meeting about the process a little bit easier. You know, you'd have to sit there and watch the whole hour long, just jump to the relevant bit. So other people who weren't on that live demo can can see kind of what was going on. And if you, again, if you utilize the, the process well, you can, if you ask the right questions in there, you can then say, right, well, I know Sharon in accounts is going to want to see that. Can you show me that? Mm. And then when you're presenting internally to, to build your shortlist, have the right people in the room, show the relevant bits of the clip, um, which can help create a bit of excitement and buy-in internally before you move on to live demonstration with other key stakeholders. Um, but after that initial point of contact, I think it's important to to then get relevant teams involved. So how I like to work it is maybe I'll have, I suppose, uh, 180 consultants on a, on a demonstration talking about, I suppose, the, the candidate side mm -hmm. or the resourcing function, uh, job advertising, how that can go and go and talk to aggregators and various integrations on that point and then maybe run another session with um 360 consultants or 
or more sales focused consultants in terms of how the system is going to be able to help their day to day in terms of mm -hmm. client relationship building, you know, marketing of candidates and also themselves. Mm -hmm. um, so you can then get the back office on another one. So there could be four or five, six de demonstrations. And as I say, the, these aren't necessarily long sessions, but mm -hmm. because they're so tailored and focused to the people on them, once you have that, everyone has an understanding of what they're doing. And then once that's done, again, I'm talking about a, a, a larger business, then I would get kind of C-suite involved from a, a sign off point of view, understanding right internally, all of our teams seem to be satisfied with how they're going to utilize this and it's going to work for them. Mm -hmm. And then from the, I suppose the management level or the C-suite, right? Or what are the reports involved? Yeah. How are we going to track what's going on across the business, shore up the financials? And I think so, sometimes what we've seen is, you know, the users want to work this way, um, but then actually you can get to C-suite level and actually say, no, we don't want users doing that as part of their process. We need them to do that in order to get this report or this or this data. So sometimes they don't want stuff sort of automated so they can they can do that. And I think looking back over the years from the type of demonstration, like you said, initial online is, is very common nowadays, particularly the post-COVID world. I think 10, 15 years ago, people expected you just to come to the office, just to have a conversation as well but you know times have changed uh, but i think you know the, the, the best scenario for us especially with enterprise level customers and, and certainly sites i've been on before once that initial demo is traced out of the way if the software is a good fit um we love nothing more than going in and spending a day and you know we you've done it before i've done it before and actually have a have a big boardroom and you know get key stakeholders in for their particular part like you said earlier so it might be an hour's run through of x y and z you know, and then you'll do another session with another team and so on, because then it's not just tailored in terms of all the data and requirements, but then you're, you know, talking and understanding to the end users and the key stakeholders and, and showing them how they can replicate their, their process live, um, which, which is also obviously, like you said, really, really valuable. So that's good. Thanks. So Jordan, how can buyers make the right decision for their business? So I think nailing your requirements down is, is the most important thing. So understanding what those key business processes are that are non-negotiable. If these don't flow properly, then we're not going to be able to operate effectively. So understanding that those things have been fulfilled and then looking at the sub processes that lie underneath that and making sure that runs smoothly. Um, you're never going to get everything, but making sure the key things have been fulfilled are, are really important. Don't be driven by the price as much as obviously cost is important. It's far more important to make sure the process you're going through is worth the spend. So yeah, even if something's five, 10 pounds a month cheaper, as much as that might be a big saving across a number of users, mm. you need to be focused on hitting the requirements mm. and making sure that's going to work as opposed to just the financials. And those, those, those requirements aren't just, here's a list of things our current system doesn't do. No. It should be, here's also a list of things our current system does really well and we need. Mm. You know, so you always want to combine that to make your your your, your requirements list. Okay, Jordan. Uh, final question from one of my listeners: Is it okay for a buyer to use their current tech as a benchmarking exercise for their for their new software? Yeah, of course, and I think that can be super powerful as well. So, um, a lot of the time, you might even want to sit down with uh, a potential supplier um, and show what your current day to day mm. looks like and how you you're doing things in your current software. And that can then allow, I suppose, the 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 new supplier to show you a replication mm -hmm. of how your current processes would work in in that bit of, in the new bit of software, but also then build upon that as well. So, how can we make things quicker or easier, or what else could it talk to 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 make that process a bit slicker? Mm -hmm. um, and it's a really important, you know, what you're doing now is got to be the benchmark because you don't know anything else really. Yeah, and then you can see. When you start looking at other bits of software, your requirements will generally evolve because you'll then see what's possible, what's available. You don't know what you don't know. Exactly. But I like that whole sort of analogy, you know, you show me yours, I'll show you mine. Because actually it gives us a good insight as to what you're currently working with. And then that will help us to sort of understand. Uh, and that's easier again, like we said before, if we we're on site, you know, we're happy to sort of do a bit of floor walking exercise pre-sale just to, you know, show us. Show us how you're processing a CV or creating a job, and then we can sort of show you how that's done in the new system. So I'd like you said, that, that is a good benchmarking exercise to have. Okay, guys, that wraps up another episode of The Corner. Thanks for joining us. 
uh don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel uh drop us any comments below as well uh if you're watching us on youtube let us know what you thought let us know if you've got any other questions in terms of the sales process uh if you're listening on the podcast again don't forget to subscribe turn on your alerts so you don't miss out on the next one thanks